Welcome to SVG TV News for Tuesday, August 20th, 2019. I am Rochelle Batiste with the details. Child sexual abuse and rape are topics which many persons in society avoid and an appeal has been made for greater conversation on these critical matters to help protect the nation's children. Today, the psychology department at the Milton Cato Memorial Hospital hosted the first of two conferences where these issues were discussed openly to help build capacity among stakeholders including teachers and counselors to identify signs of abuse, response and intervention. SVG TV's Bavin Oliver tells us more in this report. Sexual abuse and rape are scourges in any society and they are especially harrowing when the victims are children. At the first of two planned conferences, psychologists attached to the Milton Cato Memorial Hospital revealed some highly disturbing stats relating to rape and the sexual abuse of the nation's children. Psychologist Kimberly Cambridge said the psychology department sees at least two new rape cases per week, pointed out that this does not truly represent how serious the problem is in SVG. She said for 2019, there are already 47 new rape cases, with 40 of them victims being under the age of 18, coming from 35 communities across the country. Cambridge said what is disturbing is that even toddlers are being affected by this scourge. This is the range of ages that we have. For the three-year-olds, I've, I've seen four. Four three-year-old children, toddlers. I've had to have conversations with toddlers about sexual abuse. It's disheartening to have to have these conversations. Have to, and you know, we will be doing a follow-up, but we have to talk to the preschool teachers as well to drum in what is good touch, bad touch, you know, say no, how to scream out loud. These are the kinds of games that I have to be playing with people's children for the protection of these children, for the toddler's protection. The psychologist said victim blaming or shaming is common in society today and this could have a negative impact on the victim and compounds a culture of rape. Types of questions that we ask them, the things that we say to them, has to be very clear that we believe the children. So we can't ask, what were you wearing? Why were you out so late at night? You know? I thought you had a boyfriend before. You call the child fast. She's too fast. Or even if you see there's a 12-year-old girl who is very developed. That's not something that's their fault. They're developed. They have what we call womanly shape. Can't do nothing to that. They're 12. Still a child. They didn't ask for it. They didn't ask to be assaulted. Nothing of the sort. Cambridge said serious conversations must be had to facilitate a change in mindset amongst members of the general public. So how do we combat the rape culture? We have to talk about it. We can't pretend that it doesn't exist. And we have to redefine what we see as masculinity. Masculinity is not defined by how many women you can get by a certain age. The media has a very strong part to play in rape culture as well. You have to call out rape for what it is. It's rape. We don't sugarcoat anything to make anybody feel good. But they must be literate about the way we frame the language of abuse in children. Of course, there's the whole aspect of spreading awareness. And we have to speak out about the joking attitudes that we have when it comes to sexual abuse against children. The organizers of the conference are hoping that the open conversation on these issues will shed some light on some techniques to spot children at risk and possible interventions that can be made, especially by mandated reporters such as teachers and counselors. For SVG TV's Evening News, I am Bavin Oliver. The police are investigating the circumstances surrounding the shooting death of Marcus Corridon, a 42-year-old mechanic of Belair, which occurred last evening. According to investigations, at about 
10 p.m. on Monday at Fountain, Cardon was shot at the left side of his body with a gun by some unknown person or persons. He was subsequently rushed to the Milton Cato Memorial Hospital where he succumbed to his injuries. The police are seeking information from the general public that will aid with the arrest and prosecution of the offender or offenders. Persons are asked to contact the assistant commissioner in charge of crime at telephone number 1784 four five six one three three nine or the officer in charge of the south central division at telephone number one seven eight four four five eight four two zero zero or the major crime unit at one two eight four four five seven one two one one extension two two zero or any police officer that they are comfortable with all information they say will be treated with strict confidence Cardin's death marks the 11th homicide recorded in SVG for 2019. Meanwhile, the police have arrested and charged T. Sean Sears, a 26-year-old laborer of Brighton, with the offense of murder. Sears allegedly caused the death of Onaldon Sylvan Nanton, a 41-year-old contractor of Diamond, by shooting him about his body with a gun at Diamond on Friday, August 16th. The accused was expected to appear before the serious offenses court today for arraignment. And psychologist Dr. Josel Miller has encouraged Vincentians to cherish each moment with their loved ones. Speaking on the shooting death of Marcus Carden on her value experience daily tip on Facebook today, Dr. Miller said she saw Carden hours before his death and described him as a good soul. A few hours before I received this news, Marcus was at my house looking at something in my car. And, you know, we shared our usual pleasantries and jokes. And the last thing Marcus said to me before he drove off was that, you think I'm going to be alive and allow you to buy any stupid car? <laughs> and we laughed over it. He was meant to do something for me. And he said, well, I'll check it tomorrow. And then a few hours after to get the news that Marcus was killed. Marcus, a good soul. I mean, many times we talk about persons when they're gone and we say he was such a good person or this person, but this is so genuine. Marcus, in all the time that I would have known Marcus, I've never heard anyone say anything different about him. And he is gone. Presenting the eulogy at Sir Vincent Ian Beach funeral yesterday, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez said he will do whatever it takes to keep Sir Vincent's legacy alive. PM Gonzalez said Sir Vincent was a close friend and a mentor. Students at the St. Vincent and Grenadines Community College and at universities in our region particularly in the fields of applied science and technology. The government of the Republic of China-Taiwan has already pledged an initial US $150,000 to this scholarship fund. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines will provide at least a matching sum. I will personally contribute and I will personally embark upon a drive to source other funds from the private and public sectors and external agencies. This is in addition to any particular scholarship or other memorial to be named in his honor. We, the people of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, especially in the ULP, will protect and advance the legacy and memory of Sir Vincent Ian Beach, a titan of our time. And General Secretary of the Ruling Unity Labour Party, Julian Francis, said that Sir Vincent Beach will be missed, describing him as an icon in SVG's political arena. I don't know of another human being in my lifetime that has written his own epitaph. Sir Vincent Ian Beach was one of a kind. One may write a will, but it's not a human 
that I know would document his own epitaph. Sir Vincent Ian Beach, his own epitaph. Have no drums roll, nor trumpets sound, to hasten me where I am bound. Let silence reign upon my name, now I return whence I came. In other news, a number of young people from across SVG came together last Saturday at the Methodist Church Hall for the first youth summit hosted by SPAC SVG. The speakers implored the participants to pursue their dreams and passion without hesitation. Founder of SPAC SVG, Nafisha Richardson, said she was satisfied with the turnout and that she is hopeful that the participants will put to good use what they learned. so far and I know that when our future speaker comes on, Mr. Edwards, that it would really, you know, we move from a spark to a flavor. I think the key things are, first of all, believing in yourself and knowing that even though you don't have the resources that you want to have right now and you're not in the best position, you can always look around and use the things that are around you to start somewhere and just start now to talk. Use what you have and start now. And secondly, in terms of saying, okay, I want to make a change, but I don't know where. Look around you. There's so many issues that we're all tackling. There's so many issues that are right in front of us, and sometimes we don't really look at those things that are directly in front of us. Try to look too far. Some of the participants say they are thankful for the summit. The that the different ways that we as youth could try to make a difference in the world and that we could use the, our own ideas and our own capabilities to be better in the world. It was a very educational and inspirational event. It taught us the different um, for example, I prefer for the mental health um, awareness section of it where they spoke out about trauma and social media and all of these things that could affect you in some way. Uh, well, my name is Leanne Clark and I actually have a charity called Vincentians for Change and I saw the Spark movement and I decided to follow it and when I heard about the initiative that they had, I decided that I wanted to come and get the experience and see what they had to say. And throughout the day, the information that they gave me has been very good. Like I've learned a lot and it's good to hear about the experiences and the information from persons who have been through business and who have gone through the ups and downs to give the young people a sense of what to expect in the future. In more local news now, we hear that the development of SVG's medical cannabis industry is on target with the necessary measures being taken to ensure it meets international standards. So says Minister of Agriculture Sobota Caesar at today's news conference hosted by the Prime Minister at Cabinet Room. The Agriculture Minister said the industry is expected to go through five phases which began with a clear policy to create a modern cannabis industry hinged on the use of science and the fifth phase being that of production and exportation. Given an update on the process thus far, Minister Caesar said personally and entities which have been granted licenses have already begun pre-construction work. In place on the ground as we speak, those persons who receive their licenses have started to apply for alien landholders licenses if they are foreigners. Some persons have started to do the defensing, sourcing their seeds, utilizing the services of heavy equipment operators to ensure that the earthworks are being done. And uh, after that, we are going to have the construction phase starting, whereby persons who are going into manufacturing 
if they don't have the opportunity to, to rent, or if they don't find a facility that they're going to rent, they have to build the facility. It was Minister Caesar said SVG's medical marijuana industry continues to create interest from international investors, with one such investor showing interest in building a $20 million facility in the country. Up to this morning, we had a, a visit from a company coming out of, the, out of Canada where they want to get into pharmaceuticals. And they have a particular plan where they want to construct a facility at a value of some $23 million. That, of course, is not going to take place within a six or seven month period. We're speaking about a year, 18 months, year, year and a half, and based on the weather could go up to 24 months. So I want persons who are following to, to note carefully that we are on target we are moving quickly, we are not rushing, and that we expect to see us reaching the end of the fourth phase over the next 24 months, because it is a pharmaceutical industry. The Agriculture Minister said a number of countries went ahead and quickly set up a medical marijuana industries haphazardly resulting in a product which is not marketable and they are working to ensure this does not happen to SVG. To take time. It is going to take time because we have to meet international standards. If you rush it, you're going to have a product that you cannot market because at the end of the day, it's not just about sowing a seed and reaping the, the buds from the cannabis and uh, extracting, you have to pass the international certification standards. And these were carefully enshrined in the, in the law. You have to meet the standards for the GMP certification, the good agricultural practices. They will be testing it for pesticides and herbicides. And uh, what some other states did. They moved along quite quickly, but then they have a product that is not as marketable as they had desired. And that is the last thing that we want to see happen in the context of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez said that his government is blameless when it comes to the Yarabaka River Defense Project that the Caribbean Development Bank, the CDB, de declared misprocurement. The CDB recently cleared air on the matter, stating that no fraud or corruption on the part of the government in declaring misprocurement on the project. Addressing the matter at today's news conference, PM Gonzalez explained that while the CDB declared misprocurement on the project, at no time did its official make contact with the chairman of the tenders board or the government, which was questionable. The CDB, they haven't said it here, but they conceded. The president conceded to me in a telephone conversation, the one which I held with him in Taiwan. And my team reported to me that both himself and the official who did the misprocurement said that they were in error not to have contacted, that the official was in error not to have sought any clarification from Mr. Jackson. So I raised the question to the president of the CDB. By acting so precipitately, did the official act deliberately or recklessly? I'm yet to get an answer on that.
Minister of Finance, Camelo Gonzalez, who was also at today's news conference, noted that the CDB staff who dealt with the misprocurement is no longer with the bank. He pointed out the conditions that warrants a suspension or cancelling of contract, which SVG was cleared of with the Urubaka River Defense Project. The agreement that we have with the CDB, the financing agreement, um, lists in Article 8, uh, a section called Cancellation and Suspension. They talk about how they can suspend financing. They can suspend financing if there was any statement that was relied, on the bank, relied upon by the bank that was incorrect in any material particular. So they can suspend if they get information that they think was inaccurate. Now, of course, there's no information here that's inaccurate. All the information was upfront, but they can suspend in that instance. When can they cancel? A limited set of circumstances once, they've, once you've signed this thing. The government doesn't draw down the money in time. If the government stops paying its loan back, limited set of circumstances, none of which have to do anything with the procurement process. Meanwhile, PM Gonzalez said he will be taking leader of the opposition New Democratic Party, Dr. Godwin Friday, to court for tarnishing his name and that of the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. My law instructions to bring a case of defamation against Dr. Friday for saying that, as, I don't have the actual words in front of me, but as I recall them, is that um, that Ralph Gonzalez arising out of this Yarabakwa misprocurement that Ralph Gonzalez runs a corrupt government and I see a lot of newspapers write it you know all of them can be sued, you know, but I'm not going after the newspapers or news sites who said so. I'm going after Friday alone. Also at today's news conference, the Prime Minister again took jabs at SVG TV, suggesting that its newscast is unfair in its reporting. And all I'm asking SVG TV is to be fair to Ralph and the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Fair. And I'm telling you, up to the last time when I watched them, which was February 2016, I watched the, the news. That I watched the news, SVG news. If somebody tell me, that SVG is, is, is carrying cricket and nobody else cricket. I go go on SVG TV. You know, otherwise, or uh, uh, if somebody call and tell me there's a movie on SVG TV, it's a nice movie, I must watch it. But in news, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not watching it because I had enough, and I had spoken to people who were involved in it up there. They paid no mind to what I was telling them about the unfairness and the brambling. You saw their coverage between the election in December 2015 and up to February 2016. You saw their coverage. The only way, according to SVG TV, the election was free and fair is if the NDP did win. That is the conclusion. My tongue is sharper. I have to make up for Vincent. You all listen to everything I said yesterday. The management of SVG Broadcasting Corporation, which is the parent company for SVG TV, would like to make it clear that since its inception, SVG TV News has always upheld the highest standards of journalism, and we recommit ourselves to those standards in our reporting, giving every government official a fair chance to comment on issues at hand. This also applies to the opposition, which has also been critical of SVG TV News. 
In other news, plans are being finalized for SOG's hosting of the Caribbean Tourism Organization's Sustainable Development Tourism Conference, which will open here next Thursday at the Beach Cromers Hotel. Quality Development Manager at the SVG Tourism Authority, Avanel De Silva, said preparations for the conference is going smoothly and they are looking forward to having a fruitful discussions uh, geared towards sustainable local and regional tourism industry. De Silva said there are three pillars of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental, and that she is happy that the discussions at the conference will be centered around conservation and the natural environment. So we would be discussing topics that would be touching each of those areas. For instance, we have uh, one of the topics and, and panel discussions we would be having is concerning conservation matters. Which, all, which is going to be all discussing all matters on nature conservation. We have a, a topic that would be dealing with community-based tourism. And of course, that aspect, of course, involves our heritage and our culture, um, highlighting, of course, the, in, the importance of social uh, enterprise uh, and social integration also. So those are all instrumental and they're all important in, in the whole talk of sustainability. So we're inviting everybody, uh, all stakeholders, whether you're directly or indirectly involved in tourism to be a part of the conference. And like I said yesterday on, on air, uh, it's the first time we're hosting a conference like this. It's the first time Vincentians are going to have, an uh, ample amount of Vincentians are going to have the, the opportunity to attend the conference. So we, we're really excited about that and I hope that our locals are going to actually grab hold of this opportunity and make themselves present to be a part of the discussions on a regional scale. De Silva said the conference also presents an excellent opportunity to showcase Destination SVG. This, this, this opportunity is more than that. It is of course going to be beneficial um, on a marketing and promotional level for our destination and, and that's one of the, the bigger reasons why we actually decide to go at this conference and to, to really request for it to, to be hosted here for the very first time. We really wanted to showcase what we have here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So as the delegates come in and participate in, in the various tours um, on, of our islands, we are bringing in 11 media houses uh, both from both regional and international um, on the international scale. We have uh, one, I think, from the Caribbean and there is one from the UK and several of them from the US and of course Canada. So we are quite excited for the media itself to be on land and to be participating in, in several tours that we have organized specifically for the media and of course some of them would be attending the, the delegate tour, the general delegate tour. So that within itself, it's a great marketing opportunity and promotion for our destination. With representation from a number of Caribbean countries, the Silver said the SVG Tourism Authority will also take advantage of the opportunity to showcase the talent and creativity of local artists and artisans. Local artisans such as our craft ladies to do our, our bags for the conference which is quite unique so our bags are all locally made our bags our folders and notepad holders they are all locally made we have of course also even included one of our artists our local artist Mr. Jones's work uh, in, in preparing our invitations so actually if you get a chance to see our invitations it's actually pieces of his artwork that uh, were actually used in, in for, for those invitations. During the, the final uh, reception of our conference, we, the, the Caribbean Tourism Organization will be handing out their eight Sustainable Tourism Awards for 2019. And we even ensured that our local artisans again were involved in the preparation of those awards. The, all of the awards are made locally by Mr. Randy Clark and we are very so we are very happy that on all ends we are being sustainable and we are including every area possible of our tourism product in this conference.